Nice. Uh, hello everyone, welcome to the Council Briefing of the 8th of November. Good turnout this evening, it's lovely to see you all here tonight. We welcome you and we start by acknowledging that we meet on the lands of the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation and pay our respects to Elders past and present. Um, apologies, we do have Councillor Loden online this evening but also a little bit late, but apart from that we have a full house of Council members here this evening. So that takes us straight to public question time. I should say welcome back, Councillor Apollo, from your holiday. Hope you had a wonderful time. Um, and uh, we'll go straight to public question time and receiving of public statements. So there are a lot of people here tonight. I'm not sure if you've all been before. So just to let you know that there's no set order. It's just whoever likes to approach the microphone first. We do ask that you state your name, the suburb in which you reside, and the item that you're speaking on this evening. Um, we also should let you know that we have got some interest in this meeting tonight. We have had Channel 7 out the front. Um, I'm not sure if any of you uh, encountered them as you came through the door. Um, they have said to us that they may be seeking to use some of the footage from this evening on the issue of the Charles Street planning study. So if there's anyone who's speaking tonight that does not wish to be recorded, if you could please just let me know before you um, start speaking. So um, I just welcome whoever would like to come first to the microphone. Um, good evening. Um, my name's uh, Don Barber. I live at 15 Daphne Street, North Perth, and I'm the uh, co-convener of the Stop the Station campaign. During the last three weekends, our group has spoken to over 800 local residents and visitors to our cafe strip on Angove Street. We've met uh, with our local MP, John Kerry, the mayor, and local councillors in Susan Warner and Ron Alexander, who have been kind enough to listen to the voices of the people who elected them. We've also addressed the North Perth Primary School PNC. In addition, we've had a great response from Talkback Radio, and our story will feature in the West tomorrow. During our very short campaign, we've gathered, gathered 1,200 online and in-person sign performa petitions. We've also, also had over 4,000 visitors across our social media platforms and have built a contact database of 1,000 concerned people who believe that the proposed service station, the JADAP application, number 5.2022.270.1 should be rejected by all councillors. All of these have been submitted. So our research has looked at the social, environmental, economic, health and traffic impact that the proposed development will have on our communities, the amenities, the local business houses, the students at North Perth Primary School, the daycare centre students, the immediate residents and visitors to our urban village. What our research has shown is that the proposed DA should not be considered at the current location. We are not short of a 24 hour service station seven days a week. In actual fact, we have four within 1.3 kilometres of the current location in question. Time doesn't permit me to go into further details. Our written submission, which I'd like to table tonight as well, will be submitted. We are certain that the current proposal does not fit the envelope of the principles outlined in the City of Vincent Strategic Community Plan 2018 to 2028, or the principles underlining the imaging, the image vision of Vincent Vision. Our STS group is alarmed at the benzene toxicity that service stations emit. Remember that the proposed development is 50 metres 
from North Perth Primary School. 15 metres from... Oh, Don, you have reached three minutes and I have... Could I ask for an extension of time because I think three minutes is really... Don, if you could, could I just address that we've actually, this is not on tonight's agenda. This is a JDAP decision and I've given you the leeway to speak for three minutes. As you can see, we've got a full... I will come back next week. People, I will come back you, next week. If you week. wanted to make a final statement, just oh, 30, I would. 30 yes, seconds. Yes, you would mind. But, yep, um, I, that's thank as, you. That's I will come back next week but make a further statement. 30 seconds. <clears throat> the STS group would like to ask that what is the position of the City of Vincent councillors regarding proposed development of the service station on Angove Street? Is it similar to that? Is it similar to that of the unanimous no vote of the councillors at City of Rockingham in 2021? Or don't City of Vincent councillors get the right to discuss and vote on the proposed DA? Surely, COV councillors on the JDAP panel would want to represent the views of the full City of Vincent Council when attending JDAP. And more significantly and important, they would want to represent the voices of ratepayers that elected them and why this there should be no, uh, there should be an open meeting where ratepayers are given an opportunity and where councillors decide whether it should go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Just to clarify, we have received your very detailed questions on the JDAP process and the City of Vincent in relation to why the City of Vincent's current practice is not to um, have a meeting on a development application where we're not the decision maker. The CEO is responding to your questions in full. He's just dealing with that this week. Uh, CEO, did you have anything that you wish to add? Uh, thanks, Sue Meckel. Uh, just to add, uh, do, we do understand it's a very contentious development application. The public consultation period closes tomorrow night. Uh, so consultations and public comment can still be made on that. Uh, we don't have a date for when the JDAP will be meeting to determine this. Um, but the city planning staff will provide an assessment of the proposal against the local planning framework, which has been adopted by council. And uh, we will be in touch with all uh, submitters and I'll get Don your response to all the written questions you provided to Mayor Cole following the meeting last Friday. And Don, congratulations on your campaign. That's very successful to achieve that in a short period of time. Next speaker, please. Hello, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Derek Smith for, of Lawler Street in North Perth, um, and I'll be speaking uh, to agenda item 5.6, I believe, the main roads planning study uh, regarding Charles Street. I wanted to just um, first of all congratulate or um, express my appreciation for the submission, the draft submission uh, of the City of Vincent um, proposed and Additional thanks for the late change, recognising the primary schools um, and the impact on primary schools, uh, Kaila and North Perth. Um, being a parent of a child at Kaila and recognising that this um, fever dream of a project by Main Roads um, serves to separate the local intake areas of two primary schools. It's um, great that that's acknowledged. Um, I wondered if I could to be a little bit cheeky and suggest another couple of inclusions for the submission if it's not too late. Um, the tenor of the submission goes to the lack of consultation or the, the approach taken to consultation by Main Roads WA in, this, in relation to this planning study um, and also in relation to the disregard or apparent disregard that Main Roads has had for uh, state planning strategies and transport strategies and City of Vincent accessible city uh, strategies. Um, I would like to suggest that there's a couple of other um, state strategies, um, Infrastructure WA's um, state infrastructure strategy released in July 2022 was very specific in its commentary on main roads as um, access to substantial funding through hypothecated license revenues and how that enables them to uh, produce wonderful videos and uh, plan uh, extensively 
independently, apparently, of other um, planning strategies. Um, and it noted that this was a problem for coordinated approaches, particularly to uh, uh, roads under the jurisdiction of main roads uh, leading into and out of the city. Um, and it led to a predominant focus on the transport efficiency of uh, roads, uh, working against community expectations of public space and placemaking objectives, which could be better serviced using movement and place principles in strategic planning for specific corridor development. I mean, it couldn't be more uh, appropriate uh, a reference. The other uh, point I wanted to make was that $6 million was devoted across the forward estimates in the 21-22 budget for a transport planning study from East Wanneroo to the city, um, involving Wanneroo Road down to Green Street as well for a, a planning study. It would seem that this main roads uh, planning study either presumes what the outcome of that study will be or is seeking to determine that. So I would just uh, encourage those ref two references. Thanks very much, Rachel. Thank you. Appreciate you coming down. Obviously, a very well informed resident, like so many in the city of Vincent. So, appreciate your comments. <laughs> Certainly. Um, next speaker, please. So little time, so much to say. Thank you, City of Vincent, for your support uh, so far uh, in relation to the Charles Street issue. My name's Andrew Main. I uh, live on Alfonso Street, North Perth. There was so much excitement uh, when the airport railway line opened recently. Um, and so I suppose expectations uh, were that this, the government might have changed its approach. But then, of course, this got uh, released. And what a slap in the face and kick in the guts. And never in my wild, uh, wildest imagination did I think this would ever be proposed. Um, the I can't see how this is necessary. Traffic volumes aren't growing. Uh, in the area uh, on Charles Street, particularly uh, south of Green. Um, I, I reckon this is government failure. There's been studies done in uh, 2002, uh, which talked about uh, initiatives to uh, deal with tra uh, transport and traffic in the city of Vincent, talked then about bus and cycle lanes on um, Charles Street and new bus lanes, uh, bus routes elsewhere in the city to cater for unmet demand. Um, so, but what happens instead of this plan being implemented, um, main roads say, well, hang on, no, actually, uh, we've got a road reserve, but we, we, we want more and we're not going to do anything for another 20 years. So, you know, now we're going to have this blighted street for another 20 years. It's been probably 50 years since it's been like it is. And I just think we deserve a lot more than what is being proposed. Um, in my view, it's um, social, economic, heritage, urban design and environmental vandalism. It's very much out of step with contemporary thinking on those issues. And then there's the issue of climate change. Uh, how does this help? I mean, transport emissions are the fastest growing sector of um, carbon emissions. Uh, and this is going to make things worse. It, it, it's just unbelievable that this even got to this stage and that they have spent so much money. City of Vincent residents do their fair share of heavy lifting and dealing with traffic. We have uh, eight four lane roads dissecting our community uh, north south in a space of four kilometres. So one four lane road every 500 metres. Uh, we put up with a lot. <laughs> and um, I, I think it would be nice if there was uh, consideration uh, given to that. The cost, I've, un I've been told by an engineer that the service relocation costs at Vincent Charles Street will cost $300 million. I mean, what a waste of money that is. You've got the Claysbrook main drain going through there. So, you know, um, I think the money could be better spent elsewhere. Um, so I think this plan is, is the wrong way. I think this government needs to go back and it needs to do a comprehensive, holistic study uh, about how to deal with uh, traffic on Charles Street, but in Vincent as well. We need new bus routes, we need better active transport, and we don't need more uh, lanes for cars. And if I just want two more points, if I could have, I think there should be a social, economic, financial, and environmental assessment done, paid for by main roads, to look at all the issues that are gonna affect us. And I'd also like to um, mention that, I don't know if the submission talks about 
Beattie Park being a heritage, state heritage listed park and the state heritage listed trees, significant trees. Um, the government wants land for infill housing. This takes it away um, Thanks, and makes Andrew. it into a road. Thank you. Yeah, no, you've raised some really good points. Thanks very much for that. We'll come to those when we come to this item. Next speaker, please. Two seconds. Thanks, everyone. Geraldine Box, North Perth. I just want to say to council and council officers and whoever prepared the report, um, it's excellent. Um, I support everything in there and everything that the other two speakers have said about this. I can't add any more. And but I just hope um, that the city can can do something to prevent this from occurring. It's it's so detrimental to our daily lives and the lives of the citizens and residents that live along there. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Geraldine. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name's Eva Peroni. I live on Palmerston Street in Perth, and I'll be speaking today in relation to item number 5.1. Um, which is the proposed four group dwellings at number 109 Palmerston Street. Um, it's been put to council to approve this development, but it appears that a significant number of planning elements do not meet the applicable deemed to comply standards and that the council is exercising discretion over the majority of planning elements outlined in this proposal. It is my understanding that the general consideration of discretion includes matters such as the applicant demonstrating exceptional levels of design and efficiency, and whether the proposal will detrimentally affect the amenity of a locality or impact on adjacent sites, among other things. In this case, the items to which the council may be exercising its discretion will indeed detrimentally affect adjacent and neighbouring sites. In regards to the comments that shadow cast to the south and adjoining property at 107 is unavoidable for a three-storey development, the proposed development exceeds the three-storey height standard and therefore will generate an even larger shadow on the adjoining property. In fact, the proposed development exceeds the overshadowing deemed to comply standard by more than 10%. There is also no mention or consideration as to the shadows that will be cast on properties across the street at numbers 116 and 120, whose access to afternoon sun will be blocked by the development. Further, the incorporated breaks between the, uh, the dwellings on the upper floors of the proposed development are not aligned with the north facing windows of the adjoining adjoining property and so the proposed development will ultimately block all direct sunlight from windows to habitable rooms. It appears that the majority of planning elements, uh, it appears that for the majority of planning elements, a near enough is good enough approach has been taken in order for four grouped dwellings to be squeezed onto the site rather than ask for a reduction in total dwellings or a reduction in total square metres so that the deemed to comply standards are adhered to, an impact on adjacent sites and encroachment on the, protect, the protected tree area is minimised. It's my understanding that the deemed to comply standards set the thresholds or limits for development occurring in a particular zone with a specific aim of protecting or preserving amenity. In this case, they are being exceeded in 10 out of the 15 design elements to be considered by this proposed development. On what basis has the council exercised its discretion over these elements? And why is it that desires of the developer have been given more consideration than the rights of the occupants and owners of surrounding properties? Thanks. Sorry, thanks, Eva. Next speaker, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Megan Anwill. I live at 116 Palmerston Street across the road from the property development that Eva has just discussed. I endorse her position, particularly that um, I'll give a quick history. So November 21, there was an old building demolished. I sustained damage to my home during that demolition, mostly because there was a 30 metre palm tree that was um, a young um, excavator driver sort of did on his own. Um, sadly, that tree could have been relocated. But um, so I'm concerned about damage to my property and would seek to be added to the dem the um, Oh, sorry, I just got the, there's the a name. Dilapidation Thank you, Mayor. Dilapidation report um, status there. Um, but mid-September, of course, there was a consultation to us. We had a very brief time. There were no renders initially um, available publicly, so it was very hard to understand. A lot of people 
around me uh, just didn't really get what was going to happen on the site unless they were able to look at the um, plans. So uh, that's been an issue. I want to say thank you, though, to James Jago, who's been really professional, and I've spoken to Jay today, and we'll hopefully be able to organise a, some sort of site visit before council on Tuesday. The short timeline, though, I've noticed for this, uh, where we got the DRP um, 133 page report a couple of days ago virtually um, it makes it really difficult for us to um, respond um, but as Eva says it's non-compliant so we understand that there's a three-story goodness knows why but there's a three-story height limit over that side most of us have got trauma from the bottle yard development which as you recall was initially going to be six stories but was a JDAP issue but the thing is um, that there will be significant loss of amenity. It's four three-storey buildings on a 780 square metre block. And I just think that's excessive. Um, there's also uh, heritage issues, as you know, with Ormiston House uh, outline and those fig trees, which it's good to see that there's been consideration of how to protect them. But I really do think that um, it's important that um, people's People who have been living there um, are able to be taken into account and also the um, so-called design features of this. I mean, a lot of effort's been made by the developer to suggest that it's in keeping with the fig tree and the, um, the character houses, which mostly, with the exception of the bottle yard, form that street. I think that's just nonsense. I admire their work. It's very creative. But it is just so um, unsympathetic to the surroundings, the park and the character style homes that exist there. So once again, thanks for your attention and um, look forward to chatting maybe to some South Ward councillors further down the track. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And if there is a request from a, for a site visit before next Tuesday, very happy to arrange that. So I'll um, just might ask if you could, Eva, if you have, I'm, I'm assuming that the officers have your details so I can in contact yep thanks Ava and Megan thank you next speaker please uh, good evening everyone my name is Erica Parker I'm a resident of North Perth and uh, also a public health doctor and I'm going to bring us back to the main roads planning study if I may um, just to say, I would prefer not to be recorded in case my comments are um, construed to be on my okay. behalf of my um, organisation. Wendy, you just had a request to not be recorded. So would you just mind?